We've been talking for the last several weeks about your calling. Remember some of that? You have a calling? Yes? i got about eight people. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Sandy's like, I got you. All right. You have a calling. Okay? So you're going to replace you with I and say, I have a calling. Ready, set, go. I have a calling. This is so powerful. I don't think sometimes we understand just how important it is for us to say some things sometimes. It's one thing to say, think it, but when you say it, when you kind of give credence to it with your lips, it, it takes on a different form. It becomes a little bit more powerful because now all of a sudden someone has actually spoken this about you, even if it is you. But you said it about yourself, and that's good. But why don't we let someone tell you that you have a calling? So look at one another, please, and say, you have a call. Yes. Here, here's a great success story. So preachers don't always know when what they're sharing, when, when what they're preaching is effective. I mean, honest to goodness, we're our own worst critics. I'm just being honest with you. We're, but sometimes you get a success story, and you just kind of do that with it. You know, you're like, yes. So I, I won't mention any names, but this past week, this past week I, I just happened to be in the same area where someone from our church was was talking to someone else not from our church. Just happened to be there. Okay? And I heard this person say something so very good. They started talking about their calling. This is not a preacher or a, a, a or a deacon or, or you know a missionary. This is somebody right here in our church, seated amongst you, right? And started talking about their calling. And then the best thing, Lawrence, the best thing, right, was they then transferred that and started talking about the other person's calling. Started encouraging them that you have a calling too. And I'm thinking, this is fantastic. This is what we're going for here. To where something gets pressed so deeply within when truth becomes permanent in our hearts and we cannot help but talk about it and tell someone else People need to hear that from you. This week, tell somebody about your calling. Tell somebody about one of your callings. And then remind them that they have a calling too. Now, we're using calling and purpose kind of synonymously here throughout this series. We're saying calling and purpose are very similar. Because here's the thing. Once you're saved, your callings are your purpose because they're from God. And God knows purpose. No one knows purpose better than God. Once you're saved, your callings are your purpose. God wants you to know not just one grand overarching calling, but God wants you to know all of the different callings that He has for you. And so we, we started with the different types of callings. But let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Here's kind of our, our backbone verse for this series. Let's read it together. Can we do that? Ready? Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. It's right there. Paul, writing to Christians, you, receiving the very same words, you, have a calling. It wasn't just that the church in Ephesus had a calling, not just the believers in that one place had a calling, but because of the inspiration of Scripture and how God intended for it to seep out to every Christian, this is for all of us. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, is for all of us. I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. So when you say those words, there's, there's no inspirational, test, spiritual, God knows your heart. scriptural power behind it. You're not just blowing smoke. You're not just telling your opinion. You are speaking the word of God into someone else's life. And that's powerful. And sometimes, by the way, you need to speak it into your own life. Sometimes when no one else is telling you and reminding you of these things, you're going to have to start speaking on that. I'm telling you, it's important to hear God's word word spoken, even if it is your voice doing it. I have a calling. Since the Lord laid this 
this series on my heart. I, I don't know of the times that I have personally just spoken to myself. David, you have a calling. And you don't just have one, you have many. And the best callings are all from God. The best callings are all from God. Because please do know that there is a battle going on for your life, your attention, your resources, your talents. There's a battle going on with it. The world wants you to heed its call. And God wants you to hear His call. God's calling is always better than what the world will call you to do. We'll talk specifically about that in this message today. Let's look at the four types of callings quickly. The first one that we spoke about are your lifelong or forever callings. Those never change and they always apply. Your lifelong forever callings never change and they always apply. Okay, These callings are permanent. Then we looked at last week your relational callings, your me and you callings. And of course those are concerning God-ordained relationships. Not every relationship is a called one, but the most important relationships are. Your marriage must be a God-ordained relationship. And I, and I say that especially to those of you not married yet. Your to be needs to be stamped by God. All right? Your business partnerships, people that, that you shake hands with, sign contracts with, those need to be God-ordained relationships. You cannot be unequally yoked according to God's Word and expect His blessing upon it. So relationships are important. And the most important relationships are are called and ordained by God. The best relationships are certainly called and ordained by God. Then you've got the ones that we'll discuss today, your short-term seasonal callings. And then next time that we're together, we'll talk about our sunburn callings. I know that's one y'all been waiting for. We're saving it for last. Your sunburn callings. Here's a definition of, of calling, just bringing us back to home base calling a strong inner impulse toward a particular course of action, especially when accompanied by conviction of divine influence. Now let's look at that right quick. A strong inner impulse toward a particular course of action when accompanied, all right, especially when it is accompanied by conviction of divine influence. So for the Christian, we would very simply say, this is when I am led by the Spirit of God to fulfill the will of God by answering the call of God. When I am led by the Spirit of God to fulfill the will of God by answering the call of God. It's all about Him. It's all about Him. Your calling concerning your relationship with the Lord is not about you. It's about Him. A short-term seasonal calling. What is that? Let's, let's look at a, a quick definition for that. A short-term seasonal calling is when God calls you to a task for a specific amount of time so that your obedience brings glory to His name. Again, Short-term seasonal callings, just like relational callings, just like forever callings, are about Him. This is when God calls me to a task for a specific amount of time. Now, I may not know that amount of time, but He certainly does. We'll talk about that when we get into Word. I may not know the timetable, but He does. And so I am accepting that this is a seasonal, short-term calling, and I know that through my obedience... God will get the glory. That is the purpose of me answering a short-term seasonal calling, knowing that my obedience to His call will give Him the glory. We'll look at a man y'all are familiar with. If, if you've been around the Bible very much, this guy, especially with kids, kids love this guy, because he did something pretty impressive. His name is Noah. We're going to look at, at Noah's callings as our kind of example, as a model for us as to what it looks like to have a short-term seasonal calling from God. What does that look like in Scripture? And so we're going to start in Genesis chapter 6. We're going to read quite a bit of Scripture, but it flows, and we need to cover all of that. Genesis chapter 6, starting at 
starting with verse 9, and we'll read through Genesis chapter 7, verse 5, to get the gist of, of Noah's calling, okay? This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on earth at the time, and he walked in close fellowship with God. Noah was the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now God saw that the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. God observed all this corruption in the world, for everyone on earth was corrupt. So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures, for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them out along with the earth. Build a large boat from cypress wood, and waterproof it with tar, inside and out. Then construct decks and stalls throughout its interior. Make the boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Leave an 18-inch opening below the roof all the way around the boat. Put the door on the side and build three decks inside the boat, lower, middle, and upper. Look, I am about to cover the earth with a flood that will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on earth will die. But I will confirm my covenant with you. So enter the boat, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring a pair of every kind of animal, a male and a female, into the boat with you to keep them alive during the flood. Pairs of every kind of bird and every kind of animal and every kind of small animal that scurries along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. And be sure to take on board enough food for your family and for all the animals. So Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. Now let's go to verse chapter 7. When Noah, when everything was ready, the Lord said to Noah, Go into the boat with all your family for among the people of the earth. I can see that you alone are righteous. Take with you seven pairs, male and female, of each animal I have approved for eating and for sacrifice, and take one pair of each of the others. Also take seven pairs of every kind of bird. There must be a male and a female in each pair to ensure that all life will survive on the earth after the flood. Seven days from now I will make the rains pour down on the earth. And it will rain for 40 days and 40 nights until I have wiped from the earth all the living things I have created. So Noah did everything as the Lord commanded him. Noah was called by God for a specific task in a set amount of time. And from his open obedience to the Lord, which we read twice, that Noah did everything the Lord had commanded. From Noah's obedience, God gained the glory. God used Noah in his willingness to accept the call. God's seasonal short-term calling for Noah was very simply this, build a boat. He came to him. Noah was several hundred years old. And God said, build a boat. We don't know what all Noah was doing up to that point. We don't know how he had spent his life up to that point. But the calling when it came for the season was build a boat. God gave him specifics as to how he wanted the boat to be built. God knew what was coming. And so he wanted to prepare the one that he was calling. Listen, God knows what is coming, and so he wants to prepare the one that he is calling. He said, you're going to have to do it this way. You're going to have to make it this long. You're going to have to make it this high. You're going to have to make it this wide. You're going to have to build three decks. You're going to have to make a bunch of stalls. And you better pack the hay in here, big boy, because it's going to be a ride. He said, I'm going to rescue you, your wife, your sons, and their wives. That's eight. We do not know how many people were living on the earth, but we do know that at this point in time, only eight are going to survive. Only eight. Now, this was a specific calling. Now, according to answers in Genesis, 
which is where we get our Sunday school material from, very, very trusted Christian ministry. According to Answers in Genesis, Noah spent the season of this calling was anywhere from 55 to 75 years. That's how long it took him to build this boat. 55 to 75 years. Now that is one long season if you're only going to live to be 100. But if you're going to make it to 600 and something, that's just a few years. That's just a, a season of 600 years. God called Noah to a specific task for a specific set amount of time. And so that through Noah's obedience, God was going to be glorified. The Bible says that Noah's response was, of course I will. I, I, everything that you've asked me to do to the T, I will accomplish. This is what you've asked me to do. This is what I will do. Now, here's the thing. We always take stuff like that for granted. God comes to Noah. We already know what's at the end. We know a flood's coming. We know everything's going to have to be revamped. We know that. So it only makes sense that somebody build a boat, right? But Noah did not know that. Noah did not know the end before he started the beginning. You and I flipping back through our Bibles, we do. Noah didn't have the luxury of, of reading the last chapter in the book. Noah, by faith, said yes to a crazy call from God. It had not rained up to that point. Can you imagine that? It had not rained. The Bible says that waters came up from the depth to water everything. You would consider that a very, very heavy dew each morning. More than enough to supplement all of the agriculture that was growing. All of the wildlife on the planet was being supported through this very heavy dew that came up and watered the earth from beneath roots to the top. Right? Noah's not seen rain. Noah's never seen a boat. No, no, the word flood is foreign to him. Right? All this is new. But he trusts the one who is calling him. It's not about what he doesn't know. It's not about the question marks. It's not about the unanswered. It's about what he knows to be true. God has spoken. God has called me to this. And therefore I will accept his call. Sometimes you're asking for extras. When it ought to be enough just to know that this is what God wants from you. You, you want eight different things to happen and eight other people to confirm it. When really it ought to be enough that this is what God wants has called you to do for a season. That should be enough. Now we've talked about Noah's calling. We would call that, I would call that anyway, a career calling. I, I, that's not a forever calling because he's not going to build a boat and live on it forever. So it's not a forever calling. It's not a relationship calling because it's a boat, not a person. So it falls into the category of a seasonal short-term call. It's his career. God's calling him to a career. 35 to 55 years. That's a measured amount of time is what it's going to take him to commit to this calling, to see it through to the end. Now listen to this. If you'll get a hold of some of this this morning, it's really going to help you moving forward. God was concerned with Noah's career. He wanted Noah to be doing what he wanted him to do. He wanted Noah to answer his call. He gave Noah the information needed so that Noah could move forward in faith, trusting, I haven't seen this flood, it's never rained, this cataclysm that he's talking about, I don't understand how that could even happen. You, can you imagine the times he sat around and thought, everything? Everything? But he trusted God and he continued. And it's not like he did it in, in two months and then, okay, here it is, here's the flood. Well, that made sense. Decades and decades and decades of building. Decades of trust. When he hadn't seen the end yet. If God was concerned for Noah's career and his calling, I, I think that we can very safely say that he's concerned for yours. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because the Bible says Noah was a righteous man. And you turn on over into the New Testament, and the Bible says that because you are a believer, that you are a righteous man and that you are a righteous woman. As a matter of fact, if you want to look at the covenant side of things, I'd say God has an even more eager heart concerning your career calling than he did Noah's. Because you've entered into a new and better covenant with him that Noah did not have. Noah's covenant has passed away. The covenant you and I have with God is through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's a powerful connection with the Father. He cares about you. You're not just a righteous person. You're his son and daughter. You think he cares about your career? You think I care about my kid's future? Absolutely. So does the Father. So let's just do some quick math. Let's talk about not Noah's career calling for a minute. Let's talk about your career calling for a minute. 
You spend 40 hours a week, more or less, give or take, at your job. Some of you spend more. Some of you spend less. But let's just say, let's just average it at 40. If, if you do that, then for one year, you're there for 2,080 hours. One year, eight hours a day, five days a week. 2,080 hours. Now, some of y'all have spent five years in some particular field. If you spend five years at that same 40 hour per week ratio, that's 10,400 hours of your time that you have committed to your career. If you do it for 10 years, you're just getting established. You've got some tenure, right? 10 years. That's 20,800 hours that you have now invested in your career. If you do it for 20 years, that's 41,600 hours. Just eight hours a day. 41,600 hours. And if you go the long term, we think of today a complete career would be 30 years. Right? If you spend 30 years in a particular field of work, that's 62,400 hours that you have invested in your career. Please don't tell me that you think 62,400 hours of your life is unimportant to God. Please don't tell me that you think that that chunk of your time, which is your most valuable and precious resource, is off limits to his leadership. Surely you would not make such a conclusion. God, God has saved me, but he doesn't care about where I spend 30 years of my life. He doesn't care about what I do eight hours a day. You're around your co-workers more than you are awake with your spouse. You are around your co-workers more than you are awake with your children. You see them. You see that place. You work in that building or in that field or out of that car or whatever more than you do just about anything else other than sleep. God is certainly concerned with your career calling. Now, it is a short-term seasonal calling because even if you give it the 30 years or even if you pull a Noah and go 75, don't do that. If you do that, it's still a short term because you likely wouldn't have started that career until you were in your late teens, early 20s. Still, it's just been a season. And it certainly hasn't defined you. Although some people would define you by your work. It ought not be. But some people would define you by your work because that's all you seem to be interested in. This is a seasonal call. God is interested in your career. God is most interested in your career. And to think for a moment that you can make these decisions without his input and leadership, then who are you listening to? Who's calling you if it's not him? If he's not calling you in that field, if he's not leading you in that direction, then who is? The world? Listen to me. Your career is too important to let the world make that call. Amen. Your career is too important for you to let the world make that call. I'm going to let the world dictate to me what I'm going to do for 62,000 hours? Are you kidding me? Absolutely not. I, I wouldn't even conceive of allowing them to have that kind of control over me. No one deserves that kind of control over you. The only person that deserves the right to lead you in that direction is the one who gave his life for yours. That's it. God cares about your career calling. It's a short-term calling. It's a seasonal calling. It'll change. Very few people in here are doing the same job that they started with. Very, very few. It'll change. I'm glad I'm not doing the same job I started with, Mike. I was pumping gas. It skips. I'm glad I'm not doing the job I did my second job. I was umpiring baseball games downtown. I'm, I'm glad that, that I've had some, some different seasons in my life. And I want to attribute those to God. I really want. Those were just jobs. But I have now 13 years been following His calling for my career. His calling for my life. Now God won't just call people into being a pastor, being a missionary, being an evangelist. That's not what we're talking about. 
Remember, he called Noah to spend 55 to 75 years just building a boat. Some people, he's calling you to build something. That's fine. If it's his calling, accept it. That's wonderful. Some people, God might be calling to a different area than the one that you're in now. That's fine. If it's his calling, be thankful that you get to listen to him and that the world no longer has that kind of draw and influence over your life. Some people, though, we got to just be real honest according to the word of God. Some people, guess what? Like my beautiful bride, you know where her calling is? Our home. Our family, our children. And to think for a minute that that working for someone else is more important than working in your home is unbiblical. It's unbiblical. If God calls you into the workforce, so be it. You better make sure it's Him. Or you're going to miss out on some wonderful things. If God calls you to your home, so be it. Just make sure it's from Him. Just make sure that no matter what you do for your career, it's what He is calling you to do. There are people sitting in here right now that would tell you, and, I, and, and I'm not thinking of specific people. I just know with this many people in the sanctuary, there's people in here right now that said, would say, I spent a big chunk of my life doing something God never asked me to do. I spent years of my life doing something that I know He did not call me to. I just did it for the check. I just did it for the money. Listen now. Your time's more valuable than that. Your time's more important than that. Who are you trusting? Who are you trusting? God or money? He said you cannot trust both. You cannot serve both. You'll make sacrifices no matter what you do. If you follow Him, you'll make sacrifices out of cost. I promise if you go against the grain, if you are counter-cultural, counter if you listen to God's call rather than the world's, you may not be big in the world's eyes. Who cares? The Bible says the world's passing away. But you'll be big in the king's eyes. And that's the call you need to be listening to and answering. Don't allow the world to make the call on your career. Don't let them do it. Don't let them do it. You will regret it. And eventually you'll repent of it. Why don't you just bypass that? God, what is your call in my life? You think he won't answer that? You think he won't speak for that? When you come to him and say, I know that the world is calling me in this direction, but God, I want to know what you want. How do you want me to spend 62,400 hours of my life? He's interested in leading you in that direction. Let him. Let him. Noah's ministry, his career was one calling, his ministry was another. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, we see Noah's ministry calling. Look at what the Bible says. And God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. You see, Noah was called to preach the message of repentance. His ministry, his seasonal ministry now, because ministry comes and goes in seasons as well. His career calling, build a boat. His ministry calling, preach the gospel. Tell people to repent. Tell people that there's a flood coming. Use your career to tell people about what is to come. Use what you're doing for them to see, to let them see the one who has called you living in you, right? So their ministry, his ministry calling, the Bible says that he warned the world of God's righteous judgment. He was a preacher of God's righteousness, not his own, but of God's righteousness. How many converts did he have, by the way, in fulfilling the calling that God had given him? How many converts? Other than his family, an egg. Other than his family, no one else. Did he fulfill God's calling? Yes or no? Yes, he fulfilled God's calling, even though you may not have been able to visually see anything. He said, oh, that's powerful. That God must be in that. He fulfilled his ministry calling for that season. 55 to 75 years of non-stop. Judgment is coming. He was faithful to that. He did not see any fruit to that. But he was faithful to the one who called. You need to be willing to let God lead you in your ministry. Every single believer has a ministry calling. And over time it will change. These are short term callings. 
you're not going to always do the same thing. I mentioned earlier, I've been 13 years in the ministry. In that 13 years, I've done several different types of ministry. In, in your years of serving Him, your ministry will look different. You may teach Sunday school for a season. You, you may be involved with leading missions for a season. You, you may be the chaplain at your business for a season. You may, you may get into mentoring people. You might start delivering meals on wheels to some people for a season of your life. Right? But that ministry calling is from God, and you have been successful if you simply answer His call. Then when He leads you in a different ministry direction, you'll answer that call. Let God make the call. Let God make the call. Your career and your ministry are too important to let anybody else make that call. Let God lead you in your 